is Richard Norman, a managing director of funds at our crowd. Um, we have a great panel today, and we really appreciate you guys joining for this. We appreciate that there were some pretty exciting things competing for the time right now. So the fact that you would rather be here than seeing you know, robots and mutant children or artificial intelligence or micro drone racing says a lot about your commitment to the fun space. Um, so starting sort of from, from the end of the panel, um, uh, closest to me, uh, we have Jacques Benkowski, partner at US Venture Partners. Uh, US Venture Partners, for those who don't know it, is a Silicon Valley mega fund, uh, $4 billion of investments, over 500 companies, and I think close to 100 IPOs that you guys have had. 89 is the official number. 89 IPOs. Um, Jacques's been there for a very long time um, and focuses on the Israeli markets, uh, particularly in the tech space, and also some investing in the US. Um, before his, his time at USVP, he's a successful businessman in, in the tech arena, uh, has a Bachelor of Science from the Technion here in Israel, and a PhD from Carnegie Mellon University. Next up, we have Johnny Sachs, managing partner at F2 Capital. F2 is a Tel Aviv-based uh, seed stage fund investing in um, deep tech in Israel, sort of companies that are at the frontier of AI, connectivity, and big data. Before, uh, before joining F2, Johnny was a partner at Genesis Partners, and while at Genesis he started the, the Junction, which was the first accelerator ever in Israel, which is now a very big part of F2's strategy, so I'm sure you'll hear more about that soon. Johnny spent 10 years in the IDF and the Intelligence Corps before, uh, before going into venture capital. He has an MBA from Oxford and a BA from Tel Aviv University. Next up we have John Backus. John is managing partner at Proof, which is the Pro Rata Opportunity Fund. The fund specializes in monetizing the preemptive rights of some of the best micro VCs in the US. You'll hear more about what that means soon. Um, John's a veteran uh, VC investor in, in the US. He's been at a firm called New Atlantic Ventures, which he founded over 15 years ago, and Proof is sort of the new iteration um, of, of that life cycle. Uh, before, before his venture days, he also was a very successful Tech, tech business leader, starting a company that was ultimately IPO'd in 95 and then sold to Visa. John is an MBA and, and BA from Stanford University, um, and very excited to have you here. Next up, Gonzalo Carlos Martinez de Azagra de Miota. Wow. And, that's just his, and that's just his first name. Um, I think it's the first time I've actually heard my name full. Properly. So, Gonzalo is a close friend of our crowds and uh, recently started his own fund called Cardamon Capital with offices in Madrid and here in Israel. They focus on deep tech in Israel as well. And before his time at Cardamon, he spent 10 years at Samsung Ventures, first four years in career at their headquarters, and then the past six years in Israel where he started, um, he started Samsung Ventures here, led it, and put $120 million of capital to work in the markets here. He has degrees from a bunch of different places, including a Bachelor of Science from LSE and an MBA from University of California, Berkeley. Last stop is... He's also an engineer. I think it's the most important. And he's also an engineer, a Spanish good-looking engineer. <laughs> Last stop, we have Richard Anton. Richard is a general partner at Ox. Ox is a UK-based fund specializing in B2B software for, uh, for, for, for growth stage companies in the UK, Nordics, and Israel. Before starting Ox last year, Richard spent 18 years at Amadeus Capital, very well-known top-tier UK VC. Um, and prior to that, he was at Apex Partners. Um, notably, uh, just because it was the most recent IPO in, force in, in, in Israel of an Israeli company, um, Richard led Amadeus' investment in Forescout, which I'm sure many of you have heard of, a big cybersecurity company, um, where he had the largest investment in the company. And uh, you know, congratulations on that IPO that just happened. Richard um, has a, a BA and an MA from Cambridge University and an MBA from INSEAD. So very impressive roster of panelists. And I guess I'll start just on that point. All of you guys have MBAs or PhDs from some really top tier institutions. How important do you think that that, that higher education is today to a career in investing and how valuable it's actually been to your own careers? So maybe, uh, maybe, maybe you want to start off, Gonzalo? Um, definitely not something required. Definitely, you know, doing an MBA is not something that uh, will guarantee you coming into a VC position. So if, if that's what you want, you know, it's not going to hurt you. I say that any type of degree never hurts, but it's not a requirement. Uh, at the end of the day, if you really want to tr try to get into a VC, attack the VC industry directly, try to add value to some of the partners today, doing deal flow, get to know them, 
and, 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 and take it from there. I love the experience and I recommend doing an MBA, but it's not a requirement for this space, I don't think. Sure, I'll, I'll add something to that. Let me see if I can turn this one on so I don't jump off the topic. Is this one on? Yeah. So uh, I think an MBA really is like any educational degree. It's got three components. Number one is the credential. Number two is the network, the people that you hang around with and go to school with. And number three is the learning. The learning you can get anywhere. You can get that online. You know, it sort of doesn't matter. Don't take two years out and you know go to get the learning. Uh, if you can get into a top five, top ten, top twenty, you know, global university, you know, the credentials probably worth it. And the, the advice I always give people is, you know, whether you're going undergraduate or graduate, you know, don't strive for an A plus in every class. Get the B plus or the A minus and get to meet people because the people you meet are going to be a lot more important to you the rest of your life than whether you got a B plus or an A minus in that class. So in our crowd's investor base, we have today, I think the number is close to 25,000 accredited investors. A lot of those are highly educated, intelligent people. And, and our crowd's platform allows those investors to really pick and choose from some of the best venture deals in the market. So one of the questions that often kind of gets levied at me um, is, is you know, with that sort of choice and access today, why are funds relevant to people? Why, why, why invest in a fund and pick a fund when you can go and, and pick your own deals? Jack? Yeah, so uh, I came into venture by mistake. I was an entrepreneur a um, couple of times and US Venture Partners was an investor. And when I sold my second company after being uh, going through the dot-com and the dot-bomb in 2004, I was so tired. I didn't want to do anything and just say, just come and hang out with us. And I stayed. Um, I think people underestimate how complicated it is to be a good investor. And I came into it, I'm like, hey, I'm a smart dude, kind of. And, you know, I get this, I, I figured it out, you know, 12 months into it, I had a pole point to start my own fund and, you know, I, I got it. I'm now 14 years at USVP. I think I'm starting to get it, uh, but it's hard, it's hard. And, and I went to one of the best schools, I mean, best schools being USVP that, you know, has so much history and so much knowledge of how this thing is done and building a portfolio and getting it right and getting the diversification and managing this and managing that. Um, you can't improvise this stuff. Otherwise, you know, you can get lucky, but otherwise you're going to burn a whole bunch of cash ma making mistakes. Richard. Thanks. So I'll, I'll kind of give a couple of um, uh, sort of uh, maxims that are quite well known about this. One, one is that um, it takes 10 years to figure out how easy venture capital isn't. Uh, and another one, when, when I started in venture capital in the mid 90s, they used to say it costs $5 million to train a VC. Uh, these days, uh, people normally say it costs $50 million to train a VC. It's, it's, it's really a hard business. And the good news for a guy like me who's got a bit of gray hair is that you know, kind of gray hair and experience, uh, you know, you get better at it with that. Johnny, any thoughts? Well, I would say if someone thinks that they can do it themselves, then good for them, and they should do it themselves. But the question is, can you? And uh, like anything, I think uh, you need to specialize, and you need to ha access to the best deals is one thing, but there's many deals, and there's a lot of competition. And how do you determine whether this is the best deal? And I think one of the things, and I agree with my, uh, with my colleagues here on everything that was said, but venture capital and early stage investing especially takes a long time and there's multiple decisions along the way. And the question is a, a question of focus in my opinion. If this is what you focus on, I'm sure all the investors you know, uh, on the platform are very intelligent, and very smart and very driven, but the question is if that's what they're focused on. Um, and I, you know, the good thing about VCs is that that's what we're focused on. Got it, so you have this, you have this focus, you set out and you decide, I'm the right guy to be raising a fund. When you go and do that, and maybe it's not your first fund, you've done this before, how do you think about what the appropriate size for your fund is? Gonzalo, maybe you want to take that? Sure. So, just a disclaimer, I'm in the middle of fundraising right now. We have... You can't say what you're saying. No. You can't say that. <laughs> 22 million euros committed, and we're hoping to do the closing as we speak so that we start investing. Um, well. You know, you need, it's a combination of strategy uh, as to what you want to do with the money once you have it and how capable you are of fundraising it, okay? Um, for example, if I were to say that I could raise 300 million today to invest in Israel, I, maybe I would take it because I'd be greedy, but I shouldn't because it would be very hard to give 
good returns with the Israeli market and promise an investor a 3x. If uh, you promise an investor a 3x on 300 million, it means you need to return 900. Yeah, let's assume that you own, let's say, 20. Let's be very aggressive. 20% on exit, you have to multiply those 900 million by five. And that means that you basically have to be in half of all good deals or good exits here in Israel. It's, it's very challenging. So it's about knowing the market, selecting a strategy. We decided that we're going to be doing deals that uh, would be considered successful if we exit at 200 million, 250 million. We're not going for IPOs. Uh, we're investing in computer vision and artificial intelligence. These are companies that are going to be acquired. And I worked back. What's the minimum I can raise? to be in the business, uh, and, and am I capable of doing it? So it's a combination of what you can do and, and the strategy you want to follow. Jack, do you want to? Yeah, I think there's another element which people underestimate, and, and you learn the hard way, is assuming it's a 220 fund, you have 2% of the fund raised per year to spend. And so if you have a $100 million fund, you're working with a $2 million budget. You, you're a company, as a VC, you're a company. You have a $2 million budget. And that's not a lot of money to have an office, you know, pay yourself, pay a few people around you, put together events, travel and all that. And a lot of times people go like, well, I have this strategy, but then they can't implement it because they don't have the resources for the strategy they chose. So you really have to do the 360 on, as you said, the strategy, but also think of the firm management which is not a trivial thing to do. But what does that say then for markets where there just aren't big exits and there isn't enough liquidity, but you see interesting opportunities, how do you think about how can you can scale, a size, scale an appropriate fund given the fixed cost that you sort of mentioned to go and get something going? Like, does that mean those markets never have a shot or how would you, how would you approach them? Yeah. Johnny? I think it's it's part of the strategy. I, I want to just address one initial point that you said. I don't think uh, VC is scalable. Um, it's not a scalable business, uh, and you know you have to start from the returns that you can make and raise a fund that you can, as uh, Gonzalo said, that you can return capital to your investors. That's the main thing. Your investors are investing because they want to make returns. And just explain for people when you said it's not scalable. I mean, what what do you, what do you see as the limitations on that? The partners, uh, the investing partners' time and capacity. So you know, there's a certain amount of deals that you can do and pay attention to and focus on, as I said earlier, and sit on the boards of, uh, and add value, hopefully. Um, so there's, you know, you can't invest in a thousand companies uh, as a partner, and you can't invest in a hundred uh, companies as a partner. So, can I add one thing to that, which is uh, raising money is hard for fund managers, and you know, in the U.S., which is half of uh, global venture, there are 850 venture funds. There are 450 funds that have made four or more new investments in the last year. That's the number of active funds. Maybe 50 of those can raise money based on their legacy track records and they can do it in a short period of time. The other 400 of them take, on average, 18 months to raise a fund. And so my advice is you raise what you can because you're probably not going to get to your target unless you're one of those 50 funds and you got to start somewhere. So you know, my advice to people starting a first-time fund, especially or maybe in a, a smaller region, is raise what you can, get a first close done, start putting it to work. Uh, let people look at the investments you've made and, you know, buy some time, you know, for people to look at it, to buy into your strategy by looking at the portfolio, by moving beyond a blind pool uh, and go from there. So it's, it's hard for most groups. Okay, good. So, so you've raised your fund, you've got, you've got some capital at your disposal, and now you need to go find deals. And I've heard multiple VC managers say that for them, they're more upset about deals that they didn't see than deals that they chose to pass on, meaning they want to make sure that they're covering the entire landscape and seeing everything that's out there in their sector and their geography. So if that's true, do, firstly, do you agree with that, I guess? And secondly, you know, what do you do to really ensure, what are your secret weapons for sourcing, if you like, to ensure that you're getting that coverage? So I don't agree with that. Um, I think people forget that our job is to find the number of investments that we committed to do, if you have a $300 million fund and you committed to 25 companies, you need to find 25 good investments. Sure. That doesn't mean you have to see 5,000 investments to find the good 25, especially if you have quality deal flow. And there's been a tendency in the last few years to try and scale, and I agree, it doesn't scale, to try and scale VC by using a whole bunch of analytics and a bunch of young people that are hitting the phones and keeping score and you know have a map of all the companies in the world with all kinds of tracking around it. You can't build a relationship with an entrepreneur that way. 
you know, you have to spend the time, you have to understand the nuances of the market, you have to understand the personality of the individual. So you can't do everything. You have to focus, have your own network and your own deal flow cultivated and then find whatever number of investments you need to make. I wonder if that's some partly a function though of stage as well, right? I mean, you're at sort of a later stage and you're also a household name fund right now. So the deal flow and access that you can get is probably going to be superior than say a first time seed stage fund. So I mean, so for, so for some of the managers that have first time funds, I'd be curious to know if they agree with that as well, or if they do feel the need sort of the hand to hand combat be out there and see everything in the market. Maybe, maybe Gonzalo? Um, you definitely have to see a lot. So particularly here in Israel, this is a small market. So you, you, I don't think it's that difficult to get to know the winners or, the, or, or, or you see them. The, the hardest part is to get into them, you know, because you're competing against all other funds. So you have to create a really strong value proposition for the entrepreneurs. Why are, are they going to take your capital and not somebody else's? So the way we do it is we, you know, we have anchor investors that are corporates. And so the promise is if it's relevant, take our money, we're going to connect you to these guys. The way we do it is we're very, very focused on computer vision. It's my background as an engineer, and this is why I wanted to promote that I'm an engineer. And we, we go into the detail, and this is what we've done, you know, 80% of the investments we've done in the past. So uh, when you become a reference in a specific area, that helps, and they come to you. And if you have a brand such as theirs, then they're going to come anyway. Right. <laughs> so, so it's a combination. But it's more about getting in, I think, than, than really seeing them. You see most of them. So, so I would add something to that, which is the classic venture model is what Jacques talked about with the USVP model. And it works, and it works really well out there. But you know, you think about what all of us have been doing for the last 20, 30 years. We've been writing checks to entrepreneurs who are going to blow up their existing industries. There are people out there, like our crowd, trying to blow up our industry, the venture industry. So our industry is just as subject to disruption as the industries that we are funding. So crowdfunding with platforms like our crowd are disrupting our industry. What we're doing with our proof fund, where you know I would argue our, our strategy is scalable because I no longer am going to meet 100 entrepreneurs for every one I'm going to fund. I don't sit on boards anymore because I source my deals from $50 million funds. When they run out of capital to invest, I write the check. I leave them in the boardroom. I follow USVP or Sequoia or Kleiner when they come into the deal. So it doesn't matter to me if I'm putting in 200,000 or 5 million into a deal because you know I've got someone new coming in, writing the terms, doing the government. So I've got someone I trust inside the boardroom. So there are new models out there. You know the traditional model is great, but you know we are disrupting ourselves. Look at everyone in this room. You know, so our industry is being disrupted. It doesn't mean the old way is the wrong way. It's still going to exist, but there are going to be new models out there. So pay attention to them. And by the way, Richard, the, the actual quote that you mentioned at the beginning was is actually, don't regret the deals that you missed. You'll have enough time to regret the deals that you did. So <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. Can you elaborate on some of the new? We'll save a few minutes for Q&A at the end, if that's OK. Um, OK, fine. So, uh, and, and, and I heard you, John, mention sort of size of investments. You're pretty agnostic, it sounds like, between a smaller check or a bigger check for your strategy. But for a lot of managers, thinking about sort of the size that they allocate to a deal is a very important part of the strategy, and I think what would differentiate them from, from, from the regular investor. So, Richard Anton, maybe you want to talk a little bit about how do you think about, you know, the deal that you get really excited about, you think is going to disrupt an industry and be a multi-billion dollar exit for you. What's the appropriate amount of capital to allocate from your fund into that deal? Yeah, so we've, as we've uh, uh, set our strategy and sized our fund, we've segmented our, our, our market pretty carefully. And uh, what we've seen is that there's a, a, a gap in the market at the scale up stage for companies that are raising in the five to $20 million range. And, and it's uh, structural, there are structural reasons for that. And we invest in, in Europe and Israel. And in Europe, there's a lot of money that's come from the public sector and from tax breaks that supports early stage uh, investments. And there are private equity type funds and later stage growth funds that are half billion dollar plus in, in size. And uh, those, those guys need to write checks of 25 to $30 million plus. Um, and, and often though, that size is dictated by the, the, you know, by the management fee on the, on, on the fund, that that's the kind of fund size that they, that they need to support the kind of the, the, the cost basis they have. So we, we 
we've um, seen this gap in the middle, so we're, we're sizing and structuring our firm so that we can, we can address that gap. And then we have to think about if a company is raising that kind of money, whether that's, whether that's the right amount of money. So in our strategy, um, we uh, have a model where the companies can follow, can follow one of two paths. Uh, one is they do okay, reasonably well, maybe it's a 20, 30% grower, not kind of knock the lights out, but it's, it's okay. In that case, uh, the company wouldn't raise further capital, so we size our amount of capital so that that's enough to get the company uh, uh, to break even, and then it can exit whenever, you know, whenever that comes along, so we're not reliant on third-party capital, because a company performing at that kind of rate is not going to attract third-party capital on great terms. Or if the company is is blowing the lights out, is growing really fast, if the blue sky is apparent, the management team is, is really performing, um, then, then uh, we'll be able to raise uh, money from the kind of people I described that would be in the 25 to $30 million dollar, dollar plus checks at, at, at the right time. So we make sure that the capital that we're putting in um, is adequate to execute the first strategy, and we switch to the second strategy if we can see the company's performing enough that it can raise third party money to do that. So, Johnny, I mean, how do you think about it from your side? Because given the junction, the accelerator sort of feeder that you have into F2, you know, investment size, is that is that an ongoing conversation or is it more formulaic in terms of what you're going to go give each of these companies? It's, it's definitely something that you need to think of. Uh, I mean, Gonzalo mentioned earlier the, the basic math of, uh, of VC. And he said a number which is 20%, which is uh, you know, kind of a rule of thumb in the, in the VC industry. You try and hold 20% of a company and exit. These days, companies need more and more capital. Uh, it's taking longer for them uh, to exit, especially IPO. And how do you and make... Why, so why is that? Why do they need more money today? Because uh, they're staying private longer. There's more competition uh, for technology companies. Uh, and a lot, of, a lot more uh, capital is needed on marketing and distribution these days once the product gets to market. Um, <coughs> and uh, it's difficult to maintain that 20%, right? So you need to think of uh, what percentage you'll be left, left, uh, left with at time of exit and how that exit will make an impact on your fund going back to the basic math. So everything needs to be taken into consideration at the initial stage of investing. Um, our focus is on seed stage companies at the very, very early stage, usually the first capital in when it's the cheapest. Um, in terms of valuation, obviously it's the highest risk and we use the junction as a platform to help us mitigate that, that risk and do our due diligence in a very thorough way um, to be able to come into those companies that we think will be able to grow and will be able to hold that uh, percentage uh, holdings. Um, so that's our strategy and multiple rounds of financing and multiple rounds of decisions are needed and, and co-investors and partners and uh, um, I think also the fact that it's taking longer for companies to get to IPO the, these days is part of the reason why these new models of financing are, are, are coming up. Sure. Um, uh, something that a first-time fund usually does not do, and it goes back to experience again and investment experience, is how do you do your asset allocation, right? You're managing a portfolio, and you, can, you cannot continue to invest in every company, and definitely not the amounts, you know, it doesn't add up. So which do you follow on investment in? How do you reserve capital for those companies that will be your home runs or your fund makers and make sure you invest as much as possible in those and as little as possible as the companies with that are not successful. So there's a lot of decision making uh, that needs to go on and tough decisions uh, you know, at every stage and it starts from the beginning of how much capital you allocate to get the percentage um, at the, the initial investments. And so, and so when, when you do run out of capital, okay, and you're in some companies that you just really see flying, but you have no real way to go to go back into them because the fund is, is now depleted. You've gone through your reserves. You're you're just sitting there watching this thing take off, but you're, you're you know f through subsequent financing rounds, your holding is getting diluted and diluted, and you're nowhere close to that 20% at exit. So what do you do in those situations? Like, is there anything that can be done? Yeah, I'd love to. I'd love to answer that because the firm I was with previously, we 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 kind of innovated because um, uh, we were forced to by the financial crisis. So around 2008, 2009, you had uh, companies running out of money very fast, and you had to decide which to support on the one hand, and on the other hand, you had these fabulous opportunities because, uh, for example, in Force Scout, which is the, the security company was mentioned earlier that went public recently. Um, there was a, an Asian fund that had reached the end of its life uh, at, at the end of uh, 2009 and they had to sell their stake and nobody around the table had any money and it was just a fantastic
fantastic opportunity because they really had their back against the wall. So what we did is uh, we raised a, a kind of opportunity fund from from um, some people that would that were prepared to take a back seat and and uh, allow us to deploy capital into those kind of aggressive follow on opportunities in, into the fund. And we did that and it was very successful. And cue John. <laughs> so I, I, f I feel like Donkey and Shrek. Pick me, pick me, pick me. Uh, so I've been doing classic early stage for about uh, about 20 years. And I lived through this problem of you start at 20 or 25%, and as time goes on, the clock keeps on ticking. You're down to 15%, you're down to 10%, you're down to 7%, and it drives you crazy. The good news is, in a great company, that 7% is worth more and more and more. The bad news is you're walking away from the absolute right to keep your ownership up, you just don't have the money. You know, that's why we sort of came up with, you know, the alternative, which is basically turning that pro rata right from an expiring option into something of value. And it's why we're working with, you know, 30, 40 groups in the US. We're gonna start working with some groups in Israel to do that. You know, that is one way of doing it. Another way that people are doing it uh, broadly right now is uh, through special purpose vehicles. There were a thousand SPVs that were done, you know, last year just in the US where people passed the hat. You know, as Richard said, and go to their LPs and say, I'm gonna set up an SPV. The manager often gets economics doing that. Uh, it's, but more important than the economics is it lets that early stage group stay in the boardroom longer. You know, stay on the board, be an observer, be a board member. And that's not only a big deal to the early stage groups that, that sort of get there early, the entrepreneurs love the seed funds and the early stage funds that were the first to buy into their idea. So it works well for the ecosystem. You could also go to AngelList if you wanted to put a smaller you know, piece there. You could go to our crowd and put it there. You can do an opportunity fund. You know, we did our first opportunity fund in, you know, 2004. We did another one in 2012. Uh, opportunity funds are great, properly managed. So there are a lot of ways to do it, and there's a lot of good reasons to do it. So, Jacques, how do you feel when you see these, these smaller funds, you know, trying to find any which way they can to follow on in these rounds and keep their pro ratas up when you're going into a company you love and you want to take as much of that round as possible? So how do you think about those dynamics, and, and, and do you try and push back? How does it work? Yeah, I, I don't think that uh, tension exists, really. I mean, we, we love people to stay involved. If anything, the tension is the other way around. Uh, and I'll come back to that. But no, I think we take our ownership when we write our check, and everybody knows what that is. It's not our policy with like crazy exceptions to increase our ownership over time and to take away from the position of others. Opportunistically, we might consider it, but I would say it's one in 10 years, it's not, it's not a policy. The opposite is actually a problem. When you have um, a bunch of angels or um, very small uh, microphones that's pray and pray and die in 100 companies. And I had a situation with a company where one of those funds you know, owned 12% of the company. Um, they did the seed, we did the A. And when we had the first meeting after the B, they didn't show up. And I asked the CEO, where is let's call him Fred for anonymity reason. <laughs> and, and he said, oh, it's not their policy to continue with the company. And I just went, holy moly. That means obviously you believe that we're gonna do all the work on your behalf. And that's just not cool. And, and the, the lack of continuity along the board and the lack of historical knowledge around the table of what happened in the early days of the company is really hurting. And so when you, take one of those microphones, you really have to have that question of, are you gonna stick with me? Yeah, your ownership is gonna decrease, that's okay, but I need you to stay with me. Did you really say holy moly? I did. <laughs> okay, so I think, I, you know, we have about 15 minutes left before we turn to questions, so. I'd like to shift gears a little bit um, and talk about sort of some of the cultural things that are happening in the world right now and how those are impacting your space. So I think one, one topic we definitely can't avoid is the crypto blockchain pandemonium. Um, how is that playing out in industries that you're looking at and maybe even for the fund world that you know, you're in specifically? Um, and, 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 and do you see this as a lasting kind of industry that, that, that you want to be involved in or is it the wild west and you'd rather stay away from it? So Richard, maybe you want to start? Uh, it's the Wild West, uh, and it's a really interesting place, and it might turn into San Francisco, or it might might turn into a ghost town. So I, I'm kind of watching it carefully, and I'm absolutely waiting until things settle down, and uh, kind of where where the uh, op 
opportunities are clearer and the risks are uh, at the kind of moderate level that, that uh, fits with my investment approach. Um, we're looking at it very closely. Um, I don't think any of my current investors would understand. I, I don't think they understand VC that well. Uh, we've had to evangelize VC in Spain. Uh, for me to now stock, start talking ICOs is, is, is going to break. But we're looking at it simply because uh, there's que questions around this, but it could bring liquidity to LPs. Okay, it, it, It's similar to what you could do if you make up fund public okay um, today because there aren't any VCs with with tokens uh, you'd be the center of attention and probably you'd be looking people looking at you would be transactions in the future if there's a lot of VCs in the market I question whether there's gonna really be liquidity what do I mean with a normal LP a normal investor in my fund they're stuck and they can't leave the minute you have something that's traded you're giving this uh, this investor the opportunity to exit whenever uh, it suits them. It could also bring some visibility. Do you really believe that? Uh, uh, we're exploring it. You know, it, it also would, gives you would, you would consider a tokenized fund? Absolutely. I mean, we we want to be close to it because it's part of technology. We do technology. We have to know from the inside. So we're going to do the process. We'll decide. Uh, we're going to do everything. You know, we're regulated already. We're not going to do anything illegal, anything gray. Everything will be authorized. But we're definitely going to look at it. Um, you have to be there, I think. You have to understand, irrespective of whether you end up not issuing it. But I think we have to be close to it because it's another uh, disrupting factor like our crowd or proof, which are great models. So we have to look at it. Johnny, you obviously see a lot of the deep tech Israel stuff here. <laughs> yeah, how, how are you thinking about that? I, first of all, I think there's several uh, levels to think of. Uh, you know, blockchain or distributed ledger, ledger as, a, as a platform, as an infrastructure, I think is huge and will continue to grow. And I think there'll be many, many uh, technologies, applications, companies, uh, whatever way you want to look at it around it. And I think there's huge opportunity uh, um, for many industries. Um, for the comp at the company level, this phenomena of uh, tokens and ICOs, I think, is uh, opening up uh, new, op new opportunities. And uh, um, it's pretty interesting and new for me. And, uh, you know, proceeding with, with a lot of caution and, and uh, Needs to be needs to be tested still. Uh, there's a lot of uncertainty still, and uh, I haven't got my head around it to be honest yet. Um, and with regards to funding, I think it's one of the future models that will exist uh, for funds at the fund level. Um, I think, as was spoken earlier, or as John said earlier, there's new models that are emerging. I think this will be one of the new models, but not in the next year, and not in the next two years. Probably in the next five years. I'm going to ask: can, Have any of the? Have any, I, want, I want to ask on this point, though. Have any of the four of you, or five of you, can you put your hands up if you've bought a coin? Two. Okay. And now in the room, can you put your hands up if you've bought a crypto coin? Interesting. If you've mined a coin. Okay, go on. <laughs> Who's been mining coins here? Okay, go go find them afterwards. Can I add something on, Please, the, on yeah. the crypto part? Uh, so uh, uh, my, my thought here on tokens is, is a couple of layers. Number one is uh, it's a big market. I mean, you know, there was $8 billion in token offerings that happened last year in the U.S. There were 100 VC firms that either had a company do a token offering or invested in a token offering. So I would say it's something to ignore at your own peril and don't just put your head in the sand, at least understand what's going on. I'm not saying invest in it. I will add another layer, which is at a personal level, you know, I have a 24-year-old son who, uh, with three other people, other 24-year-olds, uh, did a $60 million token offering that closed in January. And I asked him in September before what he said he was going to do, and I said, why? And his answer was, because I can. And <laughs> There's some wisdom there, and I think what you're going to find, because in these token offerings, you know, they're governance light. We're not sitting on the boards out there. You might argue if that's good or bad, but if they continue at this rate, I think we might see a lot of the best entrepreneurs out there go that path. Why? Because they can. So, governance light today, but that looks like it may be changing quickly. Jack? Yeah, first of all, it's our job to understand anything new. So, I agree with everybody. We have to, to understand everything new. I think it's very important to look back and have a perspective on this. You have waves of what's fashionable. Uh, maybe some people around here remember there was a time where uh, doing an IPO on the London Stock Exchange was a thing. 
And then there was the Toronto Stock Exchange, and that was a thing too, until people realized that those were not really IPOs because there was no trading. And the, you know, even if you distributed the stock to the LP, it was worth nothing because they couldn't sell it. So I think when you put that in that perspective, then it's another one of those. Um, I think from a company perspective, if you token angle is part of the business model of the company, yeah, by all means, I'm open-minded. If it's a way to raise money, I'm extremely suspicious. And the reason I'm suspicious is it's hard enough to innovate and bring a product to market. You shouldn't be innovating in any other angle of the company. You shouldn't take any risk of any sort besides just taking your technology to market. And so why take that risk and all the complexities that come with that? And besides, one of the elements of fundraising, which is critical in our view to sorting out the good companies from the bad companies, is it's got to be hard. It's got to be hard. You've got to convince one of those people or me or somebody else that this is worth doing. Skipping that stage in the maturation of the company is not good because going over that obstacle makes the company better. And if you fail, well, you have failed. And that's a very good thing to do. So whenever you have like a shortcut like that and you sort of mess up with the Darwinian process that otherwise should govern the growth of the company, you're taking a very big risk, not with money, but with years of your life that you're going to invest into building a company that if you had gone through the normal filtering process, probably would not have made it. So very important to have those longer term perspective, but at the same time also understand whatever is new. I want to come back to something you said for a second, if I may. I don't think our crowd is disrupting the venture market at all. Controversial. And, and no, not, not controversial at all, very positive, actually. Look, I'll crowd invest in one of my companies uh, that I'm on the board of, you know, I invited you guys and you did your diligence and you invested and you're an investor, you know, cool. The fact that you got crowdfunding as the sources of your money, to me, it's no difference as a board member, you're an investor, cool, welcome. If you invest in funds as you're responsible for doing, you're an LP. The fact that your money comes directly from people as opposed to a pension fund, not relevant to me either. And so I welcome that, but I think the real disruption is to the money managers, not to the venture guys. You know, enabling individual investors to bypass that whole access thing where you know Goldman Sachs and the likes are like, well, if you're one of my top blah, 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 then I'll give you access, and otherwise you're a little guy and you don't have access. I think that's what getting disrupted, not, not, not the venture. I think that's right. Richard? Yeah, I actually want to take that point and I want to take it further, because I, I, I agree that it's uh, not, not disruptive on the, on the funding side, but it's very disruptive on the, on the sourcing of capital side. And um, it, it's not just that it opens up access to the, uh, to, to the asset class, to, 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 to individuals away from institutions, but from my perspective as a manager, it means that the people that I'm that I'm dealing with that are invested in me have a have a direct connection to the companies, and those individuals are uh, a lot of a lot of them, a lot of you, are are connected to uh, uh, real business, real corporates. Whereas the institutional investors that, that that are invested in me, and there are quite a few, and I hope there are none in the room, they are dry as you know, they're dry as sawdust, and they are so disconnected from the real world of business for for um, the portfolio companies in which in which I invest so it's it's just super super positive to have to have this type of capital in in, in the mix what's fun is when you have the panels with portfolio companies they don't say holy moly and dry as sawdust but <laughs> you can tell this is a different caliber um, okay so later this afternoon um, we, have, we have these tech talks sort of like TED talks for the tech industry and so Ronald Cohen founder of Apex, um, is speaking, and he's really seen today as sort of the pioneer of impact investing. And I'm curious, his, his view is profit and purpose really are tied together, and that the world is really going to need to move into thinking about investments with, with sort of the social good that they can generate as well. So my question to you guys is, you know, one, do you agree with that? Um, and two, you know, if so, what are you actually doing to, to realize on that? Richard, sorry. Uh, so I, I learned the business from Ronald in the in in the mid '90s uh, at at Apex, and he's actually the person who inspired me to uh, build my my career in this area. So we sort of really see eye eye to eye on things, and I I got very excited about this about this business um, because it's uh, you know an ethical way to make money, but also because it creates jobs. 
uh, very uh, good, high-value, fulfilling uh, jobs for uh, people, and it, and it encourages education. That that is what you need to get into those kind of uh, high-value jobs. So I, 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 for me, that's that's enough purpose, and it's a it's a really good one. So I, I would add, well, we have several companies in the portfolio where you know purpose is a big part of what they're doing, and I think that's great for entrepreneurs. You know, I'll be the skunk at the picnic on this one, though, and say as a venture investor, uh, my job is to maximize returns for my investors. And I think it is brain dead to say I'm only going to invest in this subset, you know, of deals out there. I'm only going to invest in, you know, deals that come from New York City, or I'm only going to invest in, you know, deals that, you know, have a social purpose. Because what you're doing is you're carving up the universe of opportunities and saying I'm going to only look at a subset of them. So as a venture manager, I think it's great when we come across them, but I want my net to cast, you know, be as cast as wide as possible and look at as many things as possible. Jack? Yeah, um, interesting question for sure. So historically, we have, you know, I mean, USVP is very Jewish. We, we've had a history of having a lot of Jewish partners, and there's sort of a, a Jewishness to it, like being a man, she's really important. And part of that came through, you know, what we don't do. We don't do alcohol, we don't do tobacco, we don't do things that are bad. Uh, we refuse to invest in a digital lottery, as an example, because we thought lottery is not a good thing. You know, it's making poor people poor. Um, and so I think there's a bit of that that's there anyway. But I think I agree with you, but then I don't. I think the next generation of entrepreneur and the next generation of consumers will will make that matter. Mm -hmm. And the fact that it will make it matter will impact returns. Who's demanding that from them or why are they going to do I that? I think I think it's in the it's in the society. It's, it's in just the, what uh, millennials are doing now? Not just millennials. I think, you know, there's a whole stream that hey, we can't keep doing this the way we've been doing it or we're just gonna blow ourselves up. Um, and so people want to make it better. And I think that will influence what people buy. It will influence where people work and it will influence uh, what people think of services. If you look at the quasi-collapse of Uber and the miraculous rise of Lyft last year, it was entirely driven by perception that Uber was not a company you should do business with right. as, as a consumer. The, the service is completely equivalent, right? But Uber got egg on their face as being bad people, and it had a huge impact on their bottom line. So I think it's important to pay attention to that, and I think Consumers and, and employees, which of course are the lifeblood of everything we do, will demand for companies to have that component. And so how you incorporate that, I think it's not clear yet, but I think you shouldn't ignore it, just like you shouldn't ignore ICOs. Very good. Okay, well, um, we only have a f you know, five minutes or so left, so I think let's turn it over now to the, uh, to the crowd for some questions. Uh, do we have mics going around to people, or they're just going to shout out? Okay. Uh, I know you had one from earlier, so go ahead. Yeah, well, I think that's partly addressed to me. Uh, uh, <laughs> my point, my point is, I'm not excluding them. In fact, in our portfolio, two of our top companies are a company called Zipline that right now is delivering blood to rural hospitals with UAVs in Africa. You know, it's making money doing it, but it's a social good company. And a second one is a company called Prolacta that takes human milk and bioengineers it for super preemies and is saving lives. So my point is not that I don't want to exclusively do those transactions. You know, when they happen, it's great. But I want to cast the widest net, and I agree with you completely, Jacques, that, you know, that there is a, a wave of demand for this on the demand side, so we're going to see more and more of those companies. You guys are really smart. You have a ton of money. You should try to do something good with all of that money and all of your town. Gonzalo? At the end of the day, what a fund has to be sustainable as well. Right, everything has to be sustainable, even impact. If it's if it's uh, if it doesn't pay for itself, what what good does it do? You know, you subsidize something. So I, I come back to capitalism, and of course it has a lot of bad uh, things to it if if not managed properly. But it, it you know if you think of of the companies selling value, they're selling a product or a service. If that value is created and somebody's willing to pay, 
uh, that can lead to social impact indirectly. So I think the, the key is financial returns are, uh, are, are the, the, you know, what we should be looking at, but this trend of impact is, is, is permeating into the company's culture and is going to do good. It's, it's, it's a new trend. And, and you know, we, we are uh, uh, definitely um, having this, this uh, in mind, but it's not, it cannot be the first thing you look at. Okay. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, I think the lady behind you has just had her hand up earlier. Um, so you guys touched on blockchain and the crypto space. So I was wondering, are any of you guys interested in the deal flow of um, ICOs? Can everyone in the back hear these questions? Just wave if you can't. Okay, good. So deal flow of ICOs. Anyone? Johnny? <laughs> <laughs> Great answer. Yes. <laughs> uh, Yes, because we're always interested in uh, you know seeing quality deal flow, and uh, I would it's, I'm assuming that some many of the companies are high quality. The problem would be that they probably have a very difficult capital structure, cap table, which would be very <coughs> non-transparent to us, and therefore be very difficult for us to get our hands around. What are we investing in, and uh, what happens in the next round, etc.? So why, why is understanding a cap table so important uh, to your investment decision? Well, I think Jacques, Jacques gave a, a great example of who the investors are around the table and uh, how everyone. There's a lot of hard work, uh, you know, involved um, through multiple stages of the company, and each investor um, will invest capital and time and efforts, and hopefully add value, and definitely, hopefully, do no harm to the company. So you need to know who's around the company, because that will affect the, the prospects of, uh, of the company. And I think the capital structure of ICOs, f for me at least at this stage, are so unknown that I wouldn't know, I'd rather not take that risk now as to coming in as a, as a venture capital investor into a company with that type of cap table. It's something we need to learn um, and um, get to know better. Okay, yeah. go ahead, sir. Ventures you basically fund, and I'll give an example. Usually, you have a seven, eight year uh, fund lifetime. Uh, you, a, Amazon would have come to you and said, We have a AWS, let's say we want to raise money. You'd say it would take you five years until the market matures, not relevant for us, you miss out on AWS. So, uh, there are type of ventures that require, um, well, it depends on the map, but could be substantial investment for five years, and then it blows up and becomes a 100x kind of. Five, five years is a short time horizon to an exit. So I, I just stepped off the board of the National Venture Capital Association, and I can tell you that the average venture fund times out at year 18. So they're all 10-year life, but the average, this means half of them go longer than 18 years, have an 18-year life. So we today in the U.S., which is again, so is, that, is that weighted average life, or is that just the very last exit? That's the last exit. That's when the fund winds down. Okay. You you get your last K one after eighteen years. So you know normally what we're seeing right now, and I'm I'm sure this is what you know most people see up here is you know your average IPO is now taking eleven plus years. You know your average M and A exit is up to six plus years. These are for good ones. Uh, and if your investment period is two, three, or four years, you know you're you're sitting on on, you know, 10, 11, 12 years. I, my average board seat is seven years that I sit on. So you need to know Yeah, people do. I, I, I think, I think yeah. you know, you have to keep in mind something. The venture model is a very narrowly defined way of building a business. There are gazillion business being built every day using completely different means. You know, people bootstrap, you know, do the way it was always done. You know, go to the bank you know, open one, get a loan for the second one and all that. So venture only applies to a very small subset of, of situations. Now, that being said, I think we're seeing an evolution of what is defined as venture, especially with the massive arrival of corporate investors that have strategic reasons to invest in things that don't necessarily provide the venture profile you know, in terms of returns or time to exit. And I think I'm not quite sure how to call that yet, but there's gonna be a second asset class around venture, which is gonna be mostly corporate and will have a different profile than classical venture. I think that will happen and it will go after domains which as venture people we wouldn't go. 
Okay, so, sorry, unfortunately, I'm actually seeing the clock here have a sort of an epileptic fix. We have three seconds left. Um, so um, if, if you do have further questions, please come catch the guys after the panel if you can. Um, but you know, I want to say a big, big thank you to all our panelists today. It was an awesome panel. And thank you guys for coming.